The first episode used to start with me as a waiter in a bar. You know, like he's really lost his way, Obi-Wan. He's working in a bar, he's drinking too much. I, got, I get beaten up, people are kicking me, and I'm just like taking it and then st starting out, you know, into the night. I mean, that was our first ideas anyway. There was a draft where that's how it started. Hello, I'm Ewan McGregor, and today I'm going to be watching some scenes from my career. There we go. Okay. There. Yeah. Okay, so it's a tiny shot, this, but I can remember. There was a toilet that had been cut in half, and they had glued a perspex across the, the, the tube of the toilet, and they put some water in it, so it would give the impression that we're looking up through the toilet and through water. Looking at it, I'm not entirely sure why, but I did have to be naked for this shot. It didn't have any underpants on. Lovely DP Brian Tefano, who shot the first film I ever made, Shallow Grave, and who shot this film, Train Spotting, and who shot the third film I made with Danny Boyle, A Life Less Ordinary. He was a brilliant DP, but a brilliant camera operator too. Brian had to was li was lying on, on the ground with this little French camera like this, with this tape over his one eye. I came up to him and I looked down and he just looked up and he went, well, I'm about to get to know you a whole lot better, you and <laughs> And I went, I'm so sorry, Brian. And he went, all in a day's work. And I pulled down my pants and basically sat down over his, over, <laughs> over Brian. I don't know that I want to pull the curtain back from this scene, you know? All I can say is I went down the toilet. <laughs> so I, I went down the toilet and uh, as you can see, a toilet has a U-bend, right? So we did this shot a few times and then everyone was happy with it and we were about to move on. And I had just gone straight in the toilet and disappeared. And I suddenly said to Danny, I went, can we do one more take? Because I think I need to go around the U-bend. And he went, what? And then if you play it now, you can see as I go down here, now I go around the U-bend and my feet turn around so I can come up the U-bend. And that came to me as we were doing it. So that's why my feet turn around at the end there. It's always interesting working underwater. It's nice because it's so quiet. You know, it's very controlled under there. It has to be. And you've got the length of your breath. And at this point, I was, I mean, so I was younger. Oh, mind you, I was smoking a couple of packs of cigarettes a day, but I, was, I had much better lung capacity. I could stay under for ages. So we, we got some nice, uh, it was just nice and peaceful. This bit, I was in a pool in Glasgow somewhere. Part and part, there's the mine, just hanging off a wire. But it was just a corner of a swimming pool. Maybe it was like a diving center or something because it was quite deep. And they dressed the bottom and there was like a mine and the heroin suppositories they had were luminous. There's they are, look how big they are. But they were massive, they were like this big, you know. So as you see them in my hand, they are. There's a few things in train spotting that are sort of slightly trippy like that, but that's all. Like you'd have a job getting them up your arse, wouldn't you? Well, maybe not. But. Have you come to destroy me, Obi-Wan? I will do what I must. I mean, it's been a huge journey being part of Star Wars, and for the longest time, the prequels came out, there was no social media, there was no direct communication other than critics. It had been a long time since those original three films. They obviously were so important. They meant so much to so many people, including myself. And so it was hard. You know, the, the, it was a big decision to do it. It certainly wasn't what I'd been doing today. It wasn't a no-brainer for me to say, oh yeah, I'll do it. I'll be Obi-Wan Kenobi. Until I got nearer and nearer to getting the role. And as I got closer and closer to it, auditions and callbacks, and then, you know, I can't remember how many, but as I got down to the last Two, it had to be my role. And so then to do it and the sort of excitement of it was like massive, it was such a massive film to shoot. And then for it to come out and to be sort of really panned was hard. I had no experience of that. That was all, all a bit of a confusion. So when three finished, I was off. I just was like, see you later. And I didn't, I didn't think too much about it. I've made great friendships. I loved working with Natalie. I really liked working with Hayden. I liked working with Ahmed Best, who played Jar Jar. I really had a great relationship with him. It was years later that everyone starts, to, you know, now there's Instagram, there's Twitter, there's whatever. And every day I'm seeing people going, 
when are you doing another Obi-Wan? And I realized there's this like, oh my God, there's this real desire. I, I, I was surprised and also like, I thought it was quite funny, you know, that if, it was just every day. And then I was be interviewed about it all the time. The end of every interview was like, will you be playing Obi-Wan? I, I didn't, there was no plan. No one had ever talked to me about it. Ultimately, it got so embarrassing because I was constantly saying, yeah, I'd be up for it. And then it was like weeks of, he's up for it, he's gonna do it. And you know, everyone reading in a lot too much into what I'd said. So in the, in the end, I got in touch with somebody at um, Disney and we sat down in an office and, and, I, and she just said, you, you're saying that you would like to do it again. And we just, all we want to know really is, do you mean it? And I said, I'm glad to have this opportunity to say, yes, I would love to do it again. And we were talking about a movie at that point, not a TV series, because um, that hadn't happened yet. Disney Plus wasn't there yet and stuff. So I said, all, all, all I can see is him broken, like, a, a, you know, after, some time after episode three, and he's in a really dark place. Anakin's gone. I am what remains. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Anakin. For all of it. It wasn't really written so emotionally, I don't think, but there was something about seeing Hayden and something about working with Hayden again in that state there that, that made me feel that. It took me by surprise as, as a, anyone else. I think when it started happening, everyone was like, there was a lot of people on set for this. Like, whenever Hayden was there, I mean, it's a testament to the, peop how the love people have for him and that whenever Hayden came on set, there was just hundreds of people. You could have heard a pin drop, it was amazing. Just people were like, when we walked up, people were crying in the monitors. It was really amazing to do. You win. I'm done. Whatever you want, just tell me. <laughs> I co-signed the mortgage. You think I don't have a key? It's so funny because I don't watch. I haven't watched Fargo for a long time. But when I, when I see me as Ray, I'm always like, "Fucking hell, that is." It was such a good look. I really enjoyed playing Ray. I can't think of a single person who doesn't like me, except you. That's what they say to your face. I had an actor who played opposite me. He would be Emmett when I was Ray, and he would be Ray when I was Emmett. He had a costume and makeup and hair like mine, and and so they could shoot over his shoulder. We played both parts on the same day, so I had a cold during this scene. And um, it was really helpful somehow. It helped the scene itself. And I just remember being gutted that Ray was gonna die. Like, I, I was so sad that I wasn't gonna get to play Ray anymore. I'm not less than you. Some child that needs Ray. Come on. We've done this already. I've been doing it for 20 years, enough. They're so different. It's like two experiences. Like, I remember one is Ray and one is Emmett. They're like two different movies in my memory, almost. But they were happening at the same time. And when you're playing a scene, there were several scenes where, with Ray and Emmett, but not that many. I mean, most of the time, I would be playing Ray in a scene. And then sometimes I would be playing Emmett in the next scene we shot. But you always had, it, it took a while to become Ray because I had prosthetic nose. I had a prosthetic chin and I was bald when I made this show because I shaved every day and so that's a wig for Emmett. So there were technical things that had to happen but to make me one or the other that gave me at least an hour sitting in makeup, you know, which was useful because I had so many lines to learn because I didn't, I didn't, that's the thing I didn't anticipate in the difficulty in playing two different roles, in fact, isn't playing two different roles. It's learning two leading parts lines because you've got two of them. So every night I was like, fucking hell. I'm giving you the stamp. Well, you're not giving it to me. No, I am. You can't give me what was mine from the start. First thing is the accent. I'm relieved that it sounds like, because it was such a hard accent to do. I'm looking at it not 
remembering being able to do it like that in a very self-satisfied way, going, oh, okay, that sounds like it works. I don't know, to my ear anyway. So the accent's the big thing. And then I feel like I, even I am watching two different people. That was my main goal in, in playing two roles in something that, that it didn't feel like I was, you know, that it didn't disrupt the story because it was in the audience's mind going, oh, how's he doing that, how's he doing that? So, and I don't, I think, it, I think we did manage to achieve that. I don't want it. Take the damn stamp. Stop. Take it. Stop. It was like a little boy again. Like I, I felt like them as children somehow. But I have one brother and an old two years older than me. And there's something about being with him where there's an element of us always being kids, That's because that's the, when I knew him the best, you know. So there's something about our relationship which is always us as children, and that's what I felt in that moment, where, he, where he, even after all of it and the mayhem and everything, when, he, when he's in trouble, he's like, he wants him to help, can you help me, you know, can you help, can you help me out? For the last four years, I have resided in suite 317 of the Metropole Hotel. Why? My house was burned down. The Count is being interrogated. All of the aristocracy were rounded up. A lot of them had fleed Russia. Some were sent away, um, but most were killed. And uh, this is the Count who refused to run away and who was um, taken before a tribunal of sorts and tried as being a sort of enemy of the, of the people now the new, in the new regime. Occupation. It's not the business of gentlemen to have occupations. Then what good are you to Russia? You do not seem to appreciate the gravity of your position. No, I fear I understand it perfectly. The restrictions of wearing a false moustache are huge. However well it's made and however well they apply it, it sits on your lip here and, and any sort of stretching of the lip there makes it come loose and pings off. So when you're wearing one, you end up spending the whole day speaking to everybody like this when you're off camera so you don't ping it off. And I was in every scene of this and it was a six month plus job. And I just thought I can't, I can't wear a fake mustache for six months every day, all day, it'll drive me insane. So I grew my own. The curls are stuck on in here underneath the end of my mustache. One of them gets snipped off in, in episode one. And so we couldn't physically snip off my moustache uh, or, or we wouldn't be able to do several takes. Really from here up, that's all me. Why did you come back only a year after the revolution? You must have understood the reception a man of your nobility would receive. I miss the climate. It is funny when you're playing the first scene of something because I, I knew him exactly how I felt he should be from Amor's novel and from Ben Bunstone's brilliant writing. That's the count, you know, and yet that was day one of the shoot. I think it's his education. He's terribly well read. He's very clever and witty. And there is a defiance. I think now that the revolution has happened and his whole way of being has outlawed, if you like, he is defiant with his smartness, with his wit, and is able to insult people with the words without them knowing at all that they're being insulted, which just amuses him, I think. And the water, I kind of conquered my fear of the water today. I conquered it by doing the thing that I feared the most, which was drawing water into my engine. Let me try now. It might have sounded funny because it was underwater. No. It doesn't sound right, does it? No. To my surprise, it was completely calm mm -hmm. and I just sorted it out. I took the plugs out, I pumped the water out of the piston heads, and then I just cranked it, put them back in, cranked it up, and water came spewing out of the exhaust, because of course I'd forgotten that water goes in the exhaust as well. It was the mythical part of the trip. The road of bones is so little travelled, you know. I'm just laughing at us doing it because you just think it's just sort of bloody mindedness. Let's ride to New York from London. And then there's this in the way and you're like, well, we just have to do it. A lot of people wouldn't do that because it's sort of crazy. And we and we messed up our time. We just didn't get the timing right. We got there too early. So after the thaw, because it's frozen most of the year, but it thaws for a month or two and you can ride on the road there because it's not just ice. Otherwise, you have to travel on the frozen rivers and special machines, I don't know, not motorbikes. 
in the winter, and we weren't going to do that. So just after the thaw, there's so much water melted that the rivers become really high and you can't cross them. And that's what we've done. We got it wrong. We just got there too soon. It's all marshland then, so the road is the only part of land for thousands of miles, you know. And so you'd ride on it, and as it, as, as it got evening, you'd look at your watch and it would be evening, although it was daylight still because it's so far north, it doesn't get dark. And we'd stop the bikes and we'd just put our tents up on the road because there's nowhere else to put them up. Everything else is marsh. And there's no one else on the road. You don't have to worry about being run over or anything because nobody else is there. Charlie was always very quick to get the stove on and we'd cook up some food and um, make a cup of tea or whatever. There would be nothing to do. It was still daylight. So you'd just be sitting around or kicking stones about and telling stupid jokes. And it was fantastic. And then you look down and it would suddenly be like 2 a.m. But it's still daylight, so you'd be like, oh my God, we better get to sleep and make yourself go to sleep or try to anyway. It was fantastic. I think that's one of the reasons I like doing it the most is that, again, it reminds me of being a boy just hanging about the streets when you're a kid. You don't have anything to do and you're not doing anything, but it's, that's all you want to do is get out with your mates and hang around on the streets. And that's sort of what these trips are like a bit. Because otherwise you'd never have that time. You don't just go out and, or at least I don't, just go out and knock about. One, two, three. Charlie's really injured himself. He's pulled all the muscles behind his shoulder blade. No, he was getting his bike up off the center, off the stand and, uh, and it slipped and um, he was trying to save it yeah, and in doing so... He's... Poor Charlie, it really hurt his back at this point. I mean, I was always very close to Charlie, really, from when we met. And it's a straight... We're so unlikely mates, but we... We met on a movie called Serpent's Kiss. The night we met was the, the kick-off party for the movie. And he came up to me and he went, hi, I'm Charlie, and I know you ride bikes, I ride this bike, and, I, and, I, and that was it. We just became fast friends. And then we did everything motorcycling together. We did, we ran a little race team, we went on track days. If he got a new bike, I'd be there the day he got it to watch him ride off on it the first day, and we'd do rides together. And then I read this book called Jupiter's Travels by a man called Ted Simon. He rode around the world on a motorcycle in 1972, I think. And because of that book, I, I dreamed of doing something similar. I bought a world map and, I, and my ex-wife used to was brought up in China. So I, I started thinking about maybe, oh, maybe a trip to China. And we were, I was sort of looking at the map and I, I just kept looking right. And it, and it took me off the map and then back onto the map to New York. And I, it's like a straight line. That's when I called him and I said, I think you better come over. I've got an idea. And what about this round the whole Northern Hemisphere? And that's where it came from. And as a result, we've just shared something that I don't share with any other human being. This, Like we've been through three of these big trips now and I don't have that experience with, with anyone else. You know, it's just, we have Claudio with us, our cameraman, who's fantastic. But it's still me and Charlie making all the <laughs> right or wrong, mainly decisions. And so we share that bond, you know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I love him so much. Well, thank you very much for watching. 